Well, hello, everyone. We're about um, two minutes after the hour, so I think we should get started. So I'm Charlize Kaganen, and along with Carol Weil, uh, we're the directors of the National Cancer Institute's Enrich Forum, which is a discussion series focusing on ethical and regulatory issues in cancer research. Um, I hope that you and your loved ones are staying safe and keeping healthy in our time during these times. Um, on behalf of NCI and our, our entire Enrich Forum team, I welcome you to our July 21st webinar with Drs. Ben Berkman and Sarah Hall, both of whom work jointly in the National Human Genome Research Institute and the National or, or, uh, NIH Department of Bioethics. Uh, next slide. So a few comments before we get started. Um, all lines have been muted upon entry and will stay muted for the duration of the webinar. If you experience any technical difficulties, please use this chat feature on the right-hand side of your screen and contact the host of the webinar to assist you. Uh, we encourage you to submit questions whenever the spirit moves you by using the Q&A feature. Please type in your question and select host before hitting submit. Uh, we will moderate these questions after uh, doctors Berkman and Hall finish, but feel free to submit your question at any time. Uh, if you require closed captioning, please refer to the media viewer panel. You'll be asked to enter your name. And uh, next slide. All right, so um, to introduce our two speakers, uh, Dr. Sarah Chandros Hall directs the NHGRI Bioethics Corps and serves as intramural faculty in the NIH Department of Bioethics, where she is also an IRB chair. Dr. Ben Berkman is Deputy Director of the NHGRI Bioethics Corps and heads the section on ethics of genetics and emerging technologies in the NIH Department of Bioethics. Um, in this timely presentation, Dr. Berkman and Hull will make the case that archived identifiable biospecimens may be used for research without reconsent during an infectious disease pandemic, even if the consent for specimen collection did not encompass such use, and even under circumstances when obtaining reconsent is feasible. Now, the speakers will explore how the interface of public health ethics and research ethics frameworks favor such an approach when we are in a pandemic crisis. Um, so before turning things over to Ben and Sarah, um, I need to note that the views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and are not necessarily shared by the NCI, NHGRI, or the NIH. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. I am going to jump in. So thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Ben Berkman. Uh, I'm going to start things off today, and Sarah is going to jump in in a little bit um, and and add some more detail and nuance uh, at the end. So um, we're going to talk about the ethics of repurposing research samples in a pandemic. This flows out of a project that Sarah and I, along with some other colleagues in the NIH Department of Bioethics, have been working on. It's a paper that's um, currently under review at a bioethics journal and hopefully will be out soon. Um, obviously, these are our views, our academic views alone, and don't represent the views of anyone um, in the government. So I want to start with uh, the Seattle flu study controversy. Um, and I, I think most of you probably were paying attention to this and, uh, and are aware of it. But in, in mid to late January, um, there was a group of researchers in Seattle that run this project called the Seattle flu study, where they collect samples from people in the regions to track flu-like symptoms. So they had these already collected samples, and as the COVID pandemic was emerging, they realized they had an opportunity to test some of these already collected samples to see whether there was uh, any community spread. And this was in late January, so pretty early in the trajectory of the pandemic. Um, and so they could see, they could test their samples that they'd already collected to ascertain whether community transmission had already begun. They started talking to people and pretty quickly uh, ran into some very, fairly significant bureaucratic resistance from federal and state officials. And while there were a number of concerns, one of the main ones was a lack of explicit consent for future research uses of the specimens. These specimens were co collected in some cases under fairly specific consent. And um, people said, no, you can't you can't repurpose them for this public health purpose. Uh, a few weeks later, they, ignoring those directives, ran the test anyway, found sustained community transmission. They were one of the first people to find that. Um, we could have found it weeks and weeks earlier, almost a month earlier, but for this bureaucratic resistance. Uh, interestingly, the IRB endorsed their decision, but once 
the um, officials found out, the, the federal and state officials found out that they were testing samples, they had them stop and only eventually allowed them to keep testing, but only with prospectively obtained samples where there had been uh, specific consent obtained. So this controversy was uh, sort of the impetus for us to engage in this project. The project is not designed to uh, interrogate or analyze the actions that various uh, decision makers made in this, but really as a jumping off point to explore the idea of repurposing in a pandemic. And the, the reason that this is so important, in a pandemic, time is of the essence. And as Helen Chu, Dr. Helen Chu, who was um, the PI of the Seattle Flu Study said in a New England Journal piece, traditional approaches to respiratory virus, virus surveillance may not identify novel pathogens in time to implement crucial public health interventions. Um, and to get into a little bit more detail, you really need rapid access to previously obtained samples for a number of reasons. They can help you understand, like in the Seattle flu study case, whether there's been sustained community transmission, whether there are different strains of the organism that might require different approaches, um, whether or not treatments might work, uh, understanding individual disease and risk, disease risk and outcomes, uh, and things like genetic host factors to see if some people are more or less susceptible to um, the virus. And so this is, uh, obviously this can be a vital tool. Repurposed samples can be a vital tool in an emerging pandemic. This is something that the public health community has thought a little bit about, or at least recognized as a problem. Um, but there's been no rigorous analysis of this question. And so that's why we embarked on this project. So to sort of frame the, the, the big questions that we're asking, in an emerging infectious disease pandemic, is it ethically acceptable to repurpose research biospecimens for a reason other than the one that motivated their original collection? And to say it a different way, does an emergency situation justify prioritizing the benefit of advancing population health at the expense of established protections for human research subjects? It's this interesting interplay between public health ethics and research ethics, and there's um, some lines of tension that we'll explore. So our argument, put our cards on the table, we say um, that it is ethically appropriate for researchers and public health authorities to use previously collected identifiable research biospecimens for pandemic related purposes, even if the underlying consent wouldn't otherwise have permitted that use and subject to certain conditions, which we'll get into towards the end. And I just need to situate our argument because uh, many of you know this backwards and forwards, but there are other ways to repurpose biospecimens. If it be identified, you can already repurpose them without reconsent. That's allowable under, under the regulations. Um, and even if they're identifiable, if there was broad consent obtained, then you could repurpose them um, because the consent was, was sufficient to, to do so. What we're talking about is, is a unique yet critical gap between those two mechanisms, where there's specific consent accompanying identifiable research biospecimens where the consent other, wouldn't otherwise permit repurposing. So something like the Seattle flu study case. Uh, and a note about why identifiability is important. Um, there are a few different reasons. You might want to maintain identifiability so that you can go back to individual patients to tell them that they're positive so they can take appropriate medical um, or public health action. It would allow for contact tracing and identifiability would let you link to clinical data, link the specimen to clinical data, which would maybe better facilitate um, understanding of early treatment attempts and individual disease risk and outcome. So, a quick roadmap. I've already talked a little bit about the value of repurposing. I'm not going to keep going into more detail on, on that, um, but I do want to get into some of the harms, some of the potential harms that we might be worried about so that we can do our analysis. And then I'm going to use, um, in, the, in the larger paper, we, we go through five analogous cases to explore situations where because of emergency situations or because of public health um, interests, we relax rules and norms in certain ways, um, and we use those frameworks to analyze this 
situation, this, this uh, example of repurposing already collected research biospecimens in a pandemic. I'm only gonna go through the first two today, but if people are interested in crisis standard of care, newborn blood spot research, and the public health surveillance exception, uh, we're happy to talk about those in the Q&A. And then I'm gonna get into some limitations and policy implications. So let's start with the risks. I've already talked a, a bunch about the, the value of repurposing biospecimens. Let's talk about the risks. And here I wanna talk first about individuals and then groups. So on the individual level, um, we worry about it because when someone signs a consent form, they are authorizing the use of their data or samples for particular reasons. And when you share things without their consent, you are undermining whatever promises, confidentiality promises you make about protecting their samples and data. Uh, and that can obviously increase the risk of identification if more people have access to their data and samples. It increases the risk of re-identification, which could lead to things like social worries like embarrassment, stigma, discrimination. You could also worry about non-welfare harms. These are harms that aren't tangible, but uh, are, are more abstract when specimens would be used in a way that wasn't consistent with their subject, with the subject's values. So if someone donated samples for cancer research, but then uh, it was used for reproductive research, which they would have objected to. That would be an example of a, a non-welfare harm. So in the paper, we make an argument that really minimum weight needs to be given to these individual concerns. The risk of an actual tangible harm is is tiny. Um, and, and there's some fairly robust data that suggests that most people support most health-related research purposes for their samples. And COVID-19 isn't controversial like cloning or reproductive research. It's not the kind of thing that people might have a moral objection to. In fact, most people would probably welcome their samples being used to combat the pandemic. So at least on the individual level, we don't think that concerns about harms are terribly warranted. On the group level, however, things are a little bit more tricky. Um, on the group level, we're worried about justice and fairness concerns, particularly when a burden would fall disproportionately on an underserved or vulnerable group. And we're worried about three particular group harms here. The first would be exploitation. If you take samples from an at-risk group and they're used primarily to benefit well-off groups, that would be an example of, of, of exploitation, which would be problematic. You worry about opportunity costs. So if the samples were collected for a particular purpose that was important to an identifiable group, um, maybe examining a disease that, that um, they uniquely uh, suffer from. So if you're taking those samples and, and using them in a different way, you are, you are suffering an opportunity cost um, that could make the group worse off. Um, and stigmatization, and this is probably the, 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 most, um, the, the most realistic concern, if research identifies a particular group as a driver of disease spread in a way that creates stigma, creates negative associations with that group, um, that would be potentially problematic. So we've talked about the, the value up front. I've talked a little bit about the, the risks and harms of repurposing samples, but then the question is how do you weigh those against each other? And what we try to do in the, in the project is look at five analogous cases that we can borrow from where there's a well-developed literature about how non-ideal circumstances can change the way we make trade-offs between traditional individual focus principles of research ethics and the communitarian aims of public health ethics. And so let me start with public health emergencies. We are all living through a public health emergency. These kinds of uh, infringements on our autonomy in order to benefit the health of the community are uh, uh, un unpleasantly familiar to us, things like mandatory vaccination, quarantine, isolation, stay-at-home orders, mandatory masks, uh, location, contact tracing. These are all infringements on privacy or autonomy um, on the individual level in order to benefit the health of community. Um, but, so, but when figuring out whether or not any given public health intervention is ethical, you need to have a framework for thinking about that. And so here's, here's um, a, a fairly consensus 
um, driven view of what makes uh, public health interventions ethical. They need to be taken in order to promote the health of the population. You need to think about and equitably distribute benefits and burdens. And you need to respect autonomy as much as possible, primarily by using the least restrictive means to achieve your public health goal. So we took this public health uh, ethics framework and applied it to repurposing of sales. So let me take you through our argument. So first, on the criterion of promoting public health, obviously, if you're doing public health interventions like physical distancing, isolation, and quarantine, you're trying to limit the spread of the disease, which promotes the public's health. And repurposing biospecimens would be for the purpose of facilitating early surveillance, which would then inform those kinds of public health interventions. So I think you can pretty clearly make the case that, uh, at least on the surveillance side, it would be promoting public health. Um, and similarly, if you're talking about developing infective treatments, even just uh, the, there's the One Day Sooner project, in just a few weeks, a few days, the faster we can get to a treatment, um, a vaccine or treatment, the, the, the more lives we can save in a, in a disease that is maybe exploding exponentially. And so, um, and so if you're using the sample, repurposing samples to accelerate development of an effective treatment, that would also, I think, pretty clearly promote public health. So I think it's pretty straightforward to argue that repurposing could promote the public's health. Then you want to think about the benefits and the burdens. Now we've already argued that individual level um, burdens are, are very low. So I think almost any tangible prospect of combating a pandemic would outweigh the very low risks to individuals, at least on our account. I think for identifiable groups, it's a little bit higher of a bar, but it's not insurmountable. Um, and particularly given the magnitude of benefits that you could achieve by uh, taking these samples, repurposing them early, and, and learning something about the disease um, more quickly than you otherwise would, I think you can say plausibly that the benefits outweigh the possible group harms, particularly given that, as Sarah will talk about in more detail later, there are strategies that can be used to mitigate the possibility and effect of group harms. Um, you want to think a little bit more detail about the distribution of benefits, too. I think the surveillance case is pretty straightforward. Everyone but benefits from knowledge about disease spread, but interventions are a little bit trickier, um, particularly if you're worried about vaccines or treatments only being accessible to certain privileged groups. And so it would be really problematic if biospecimens were repurposed from groups um, that were vulnerable, people like people without health insurance and for the benefit of people who are able to access the resulting interest. So that's just one particular distribution of benefit concern that needs to be thought through. <clears throat> and then thinking about maximizing autonomy by utilizing the least restrictive means. Um, so I think the analysis here is pretty straightforward. Generally, we're only going to be talking about the need to repurpose samples research samples if there's no other choice. If there is another mechanism to prospectively obtain research or to use the identified samples or samples that were obtained with broad consent, we shouldn't be repurposing samples. But since we're typically not going to know how serious the public health threat is at the outset, I think this is rarely going to be the case. And I think that you can argue that repurposing is going to be the least restrictive means of achieving your important public health aim. <clears throat> so, you can see how on the analysis using the public health ethics framework, that it seems like repurposing meets all the criteria and could be appropriate. So, let's move on to emergency research. Um, and just a little bit of framing, we, when we're talking about repurposing biospecimens, the reason we worry about it is because we've gathered information or samples from people with their particular consent, and now we want to use them in a way that to which they haven't prospectively agreed. Um, and generally, that's something we don't do, but in crisis situations where the costs associated with losing time uh, to obtain informed consent are high enough, then we're sometimes willing to, to make exceptions. And so we thought it would be instructive to examine the ethics of obtaining informed consent in other exceptionally time-sensitive circumstances. And we looked at emergency research. Think about 
someone that goes into an ER with a um, heart attack or a stroke where time is of essence and they want to try treatment A and treatment B and there's just no time to get consent from the relative of this person who's unconscious. Um, and so in those kinds of cases, we have uh, ethically and regulatorily allowed researchers to proceed without prospectively obtaining consent. And so let's think about the emergency research framework and see how it applies to repurposing. So there, there are four, three and a half, four criteria. Roughly there, the trial has to meet the ordinary standards of conducting biomedical research. I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm just gonna assume that anything that we're doing is within the bounds of normal research ethics. None of the possible methods for obtaining consent are practicable, so the practicability criterion. Um, people argue that you need to take extra precautions uh, to protect emergency research participants. And again, I'm gonna bracket that because I think that's less relevant to the case at hand. Um, and generally, you don't want evidence that the research would go against the patient's preferences. So I'm gonna talk about the two, uh, two in red right now. So practicability, is there any other way to obtain consent? And like with the, the last um, bit of analysis, since public health emergencies emerge without much warning, limiting the ability, uh, it, it really limits our ability to prospectively recruit subjects. It's gonna emerge so quickly and without warning, we're not gonna be able to set up the infrastructure to start collecting samples like the Seattle flu study already had in place. Um, and so the relevant questions about a pandemic that will require early and expeditious analysis will almost always require access to biospecimens taken from patients collected before anyone would have known to get consent for such activities. So really this is going to be the only practicable way to do this. There aren't gonna be other ways to obtain consent to get those early already collected samples. Um, and then on the question of whether or not there's evidence that repurposing would be against someone's preference, I think it would be very rare on an individual level. Um, subjects are going to usually have had a chance to ex positively express such a view. Um, and I'd argue that we've already got some evidence. They've already agreed to donate their samples to research. So they're already, at least on some level, okay with the idea of altruistically contributing to the research enterprise. Um, so I think on an individual level, it's not something we need to worry a ton about. Um, if there is positive evidence of an identifiable group's concerns about repurposing, transparency and consultation are indicated. Again, this is something that Sarah is gonna talk about in a bit. All right, so we've made the case and we go through the three other um, cases in our in our full piece and sort of argue that cumulatively there are lots of situations where we already relax research ethics rules and norms because of exceptional circumstances and that repurposing already collected biospecimens in the context of a, of a serious pandemic threat um, generally satisfy all the frameworks and criteria that we have talked about in those other cases and so this is something that we should generally be okay with. But I want to I want to put on a couple of limitations. First there's there's one about severity. So we argue that repurposing is only appropriate when the magnitude of the threat is sufficiently high. And here magnitude is as the standard formulation goes, accounting for both the, the sort of size of the potential harm and the probability that it manifests. So it wouldn't be appropriate to repurpose samples if the pandemic is sort of a low-level pandemic where it's not there's not a lot of incidents or infection rates or where there are effective treatments so people aren't going to die. It also wouldn't be appropriate to repurpose samples for the purpose of, you know, looking for theoretical pandemics that there's a tiny probability that they exist out there. Um, those are all things that you should collect prospective uh, consent for uh, if you want to uh, study those kinds of problems. It's really only in the super severe cases where repurposing is justified. Um, the second limitation is that it needs to be an effective tool for combating a pandemic. So the repurposed samples must actually help you answer an urgently important scientific question and do so in a way, in a methodolo methodologically sound way, capable of actually answering that question. And they have to be sort of 
uniquely suited for answering that question. So again, if there are de-identified samples that can help you answer the question or um, or or broadly uh, consented question uh, samples that, that could help you answer those questions, then you should use those instead. So it's only when it's a unique, effective tool for combating a pandemic that repurposing should be justified. And finally, a few policy implications. Um, we argue, maybe controversially, and we can maybe talk about this in the Q&A, that there's no need to obtain new consent even if it's feasible, um, largely because it would take time and effort. And since we're, we're worried so much about maximizing the production of knowledge quickly, um, even if it was feasible to obtain new consent, we don't think it is necessary. We think that it's appropriate for researchers and public health officials to just repurpose those samples and do their, their work quickly. Um, we also argue that decision makers should draw on existing ethical frameworks and regulatory flexibilities in creative ways to favor the conduct of research that's critical to the public public's health and safety. Um, and we think that it might be appropriate to add consent language. We've already got some really good broad consent language that anticipates broad research uses of um, of sample, but maybe we'd want to alert people that it's possible that they could be also repurposed for public health purposes. And then finally, we think that there are a number of ways to mitigate group harms um, that, that are feasible and that should be maximized to the extent possible. And this is where I'm going to hand it off to Sarah to talk about some of these issues relating to group harms. Great. Thank you, Ben, for doing the heavy lifting here. And also, thank you to the organizers so much for this opportunity to present this project um, to the Enrich Forum. It's, it's nice to be back uh, with this crowd. Um, I've, I've been at the NIH now for more than 21 years, and I've been thinking about the ethics of using biospecimens uh, for most of my career. But in, in some ways, it, it feels like all of that was a dress rehearsal for this moment. This feels like the time we really have to get it right with so much at stake. Um, when Ben and I started exploring this question about the ethics of repurposing samples, it was just after the story regarding the Seattle flu study broke here in the New York Times way back on March 10th, which was really early on in our emerging understanding of this pandemic. And I'll confess that my initial reaction to reading this was a very emotional one uh, I was angry. I was angry about what seemed to be a very important missed opportunity to gain important information at a time when we still knew almost nothing about the epidemiology of COVID-19, its travel patterns, uh, and, and impact on populations. And so after taking a deep breath or two and speaking to Ben and some of our colleagues, we decided it would be useful to take a step back and analyze this kind of repurposing case, carefully using the tools of public health ethics that both Ben and I and a number of our collabor collaborators were originally trained in, uh, so that the next time that this comes up, researchers and public health officials uh, might at least have some well-reasoned ar ethical arguments to draw upon when under tremendous pressure. And although we were reasonably confident in our conclusions, one of the issues that was challenging for us and that continues to worry me was reckoning with this issue of the risks of group harm and how to mitigate those risks. Uh, there is precedent for being worried about the potential for group harms in the context of um, using biospecimens without explicit consent for unanticipated future uses. And we were certainly aware that these would need to be taken into account in our own analysis here. And so just to reiterate some of the points that Ben raised earlier, we're concerned about cases in which repurposing samples runs the risk of burdening certain groups disproportionately. And in the paper, we imagine some instances in which one's, one group's resources are exploited to benefit another group, in which a community's own valuable resources are redirected from being used for other important research that could also be a benefit to that particular group, or that could lead to stigmatization of the populations who become identified with the results of these kinds of activities. 
And even though we did our best at the time to anticipate these kind of cases, these kind of cases when we wrote the paper, uh, we didn't actually know just how hard minority populations would be hit by the pandemic, both in terms of the infection and mortality rates, but also in terms of things like access to funding, supportive resources, and data that should have been made available much sooner than they were. And I've been paying uh, close attention to the impact on American Indian and Alaska Native populations especially, who have been reported to have among the highest rates of hospitalization and death from COVID-19 as compared to non-Hispanic whites as well as other populations. And there's also been problems with the under-reporting, over-generalizing, and othering of data about the impacts on tribal communities, which has made it harder to get a handle on the specific challenges that they face. And this fits into broader conversations that we really need to be having about data sovereignty and decolonization of research data if we're serious about meaningful partnerships with tribal communities to address health disparities. And these have to be happening in an extended way over time and not just at the moment of an emergency. So this article, which actually just came out a few days in the New England Journal, also makes some important points about responding to the disparities that we're seeing in COVID-19. Um, although more and better data about these disparities are needed, it's not enough simply to throw more data at the problem without including a careful analysis of underlying structural factors. That, that might actually cause more harm than good if we do that. For example, we risk contributing to, um, to a form of structural racism that some have called territorial stigmatization. If we, uh, if we disaggregate COVID data by city or by neighborhood without also highlighting place-based risk, resource deficits, and other structural factors that contribute to the unequal distribution of disease um, in these places. So I've been looking back regularly at our own recommendations to see if they map on to these emerging analyses regarding group interests and to make sure that they, we, our recommendations aren't going to do more harm than good. And uh, in addition to paying attention to stigmatization and the need for community engagement regarding uh, the design of, of both research projects themselves as well as public health interventions that, that flow from, the, from the, the findings of such research, I think it's good that we also suggested that the impact on groups will need to be monitored over time and that we may need to refine policies and decisions in light of what we learn. And so I know it's still pretty early on, but at this point in time, just a few months in, I've uh, come across two additional cases, analogous sorts of cases that have increased my confidence that our recommendations regarding group, group harms will hold up. Uh, the, the first case illustrates how a process of tribal consultation was utilized to make a decision not to proceed with research with existing samples that ran the risk of being more harmful than beneficial to tribal uh, communities. And the second appears to be a pretty egregious practice that's still under investigation by the state of New Mexico of a hospital policy that promoted racial, prof racial profiling of indigenous pregnant women and a pra it, this is a practice that's going to fail to meet the core ethics principles, the public health ethics principles that our analysis depended upon. So in the first case, the All of Us program at the NIH realized that it already had a collection of samples. I think they were collected uh, in the time period between last fall and March of this year, that it could test for the presence of coronavirus antibodies. Now, this case isn't exactly analogous to the Seattle flu study, because I, I believe the All of Us consent forms do have some discussion of ongoing research uses of the samples, of the intention to do ongoing research with these samples. Um, so although this kind of look back study could provide important public health information, maybe helping to pinpoint uh, when and where coronavirus entered the US, maybe providing eventually individual benefits, from results down the road. The program recognized that there was potential for stigmatization and other kinds of group harms, especially when reporting out their findings by group identifiers. Um, and so my understanding is that it had already been decided 
uh, that data or that samples from all of us participants who self-identified as American Indian or Alaska Native would be excluded from all of us research testing until a fuller program-wide tribal consultation process um, that's been underway was completed and that appropriate policies were developed as a result. And I've heard that this may be um, done as soon as the end of this summer, but it wasn't done yet at the time these questions came up. But a decision was made to hold an interim rapid response tribal consultation to consider whether their, their samples, these samples could be used for the COVID-19 study, which of course hadn't been previously anticipated, but was viewed as something that might be beneficial specifically to tribal populations given the emerging epidemiology, what we know about the epidemiology of the disease. But ultimately, this rapid consultation led to the decision not to proceed with including samples from individuals who self-identified as American Indian and Alaska Native in this COVID-19 serology study at this time. And the, the results, the report of these findings is included on the All of Us website. But in a nutshell, it was because the risks were felt to potentially outweigh the benefits to tribal communities as a whole based on a lot of feedback that was provided during the consultation process. And so jumping out ahead of that risk, also subverting the main consultation that was taking place in a way that could be confusing, in a way that could undermine the, the trust building process. So this is a case where ethics consult, I mean, where tribal, excuse me, consultation was appropriate and led to an outcome not to proceed with um, the sort of um, uh, repurposing idea that, that, that we analyzed in this project. And so I think it's an example of consultation working um, to protect the interests of groups. Now in this second case, which was reported in a series of articles in ProPublica and New Mexico, uh, sorry, New Mexico in depth last month, um, it, it appears, well, according to these reports, a hospital in Albuquerque, New Mexico, developed a secretive practice of screening pregnant women based on their appearance, based on whether they appeared to look Native American and then checking if they lived in a particular zip code. In other words, racial profiling. And this finding would be enough to designate them as under investigation for COVID-19 and sometimes led to them being separated from their newborns even before COVID test results were returned and without their prior consent. Presumably this was to decrease the risk of COVID-19 transmission from mother to newborn. But I think it's pretty clear that this sort of policy uh, would not follow current screening recommendations um, and it also uh, calls into question the trustworthiness of the healthcare institutions that are serving tribal populations. Um, and al although it may seem obvious from these reports that this case is, is very eth ethically problematic. Um, this case does increase my confidence in the public health ethics framework that we described in our analysis. So in, in no way do these frameworks or did our analysis say that one can do anything they want in the name of public health. The framework sets forth clear requirements for policies to be effective, scientifically well-grounded, implemented in a fair and respectful manner and using the least res restrictive means of achieving important public health goals. So we're really eager to hear your feedback and, and questions, other cases you may be familiar with. But before I transition to the Q&A, let me just briefly bring us back to the uh, main argument that Ben presented. Although there already exists some ethical and legal bases that permit the use of certain categories of samples without consent, investigating an emerging pandemic may push us to need to consider allowing access to specimens that fall outside of these familiar mechanisms. And so we do argue for a presumption in favor of repurposing identifiable research specimens in the context of this kind of an emergency situation and we, we say that even if the original consent, the original research consent didn't anticipate this particular use. And we believe we can rely on a robust public health ethics framework and relevant precedent to guide the circumstances under which such decisions are ethically supportable as well as when they're not. And then finally, I just want to acknowledge our collaborator, whoops, did I go the wrong way? <laughs> 
I want to acknowledge our collaborators and co-authors from the University of Washington and the NIH, um, and now uh, as well as the Department of Bioethics for uh, talking through an earlier version of this with us. Um, and now I'll turn the microphone back to the organizers to facilitate the Q&A portion of this forum. Thanks again so much for taking the time to listen to our presentations today. Uh, hi, thank you so much, Sarah and Ben. This is Carol. Uh, I apologize, I had some technical difficulties earlier, uh, so I wasn't able to introduce our speakers, um, but uh, thankfully I'm, I'm back in. Um, this is Carol Weil from the NCI. Um, I will start with some of the questions that were submitted during your presentation. Uh, the first is, I know this project was U.S.-based, but can you comment on the EU-based studies? It seems like the GDPR would never allow um, this access uh, when used outside uh, the EEA. And do you have any thoughts about uh, that issue, the European samples? Or samples, I guess, that uh, had some uh, connection to um, uh, uh, dissemination in a European uh, Union country? <clears throat> So uh, let me let me just say that I don't I don't want to get into a detailed analysis of the European Union's uh, privacy regulations, but but one of the big points, and I, I mentioned it briefly, was to say that that in this kind of pandemic emergency situation, um, there might be research ethics or other regulatory um, rules in place that have good reasons to be in place, but but we, we wanted and encouraged uh, public health officials and, and government officials to, to make use of any sort of regulatory flexibility um, that they could, because we think that the, the arguments for the justification for you repurposing samples in an emergency um, will, in most cases, outweigh the kinds of privacy or confidentiality or autonomy-based individual concerns that um, that are they're very important, but 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 maybe lose out in a in a public health emergency situation. So without getting into details about the EU regulations in particular, I think that's a great example of a case where we might want to think about when we're writing those laws, writing in some regulatory flexibility to relax them in a public health emergency, or for um, officials to make use of emergency powers or um, or other regulatory mechanisms to achieve these uh, public health goals in a crisis moment. So like we have under the, the human subject protection regulations, those sorts of protections. Um, uh, so just a, a quick question. Uh, this is an excellent analysis. When will your paper be available? Do you have a sense of when your publication will be out? It's been under review for a month six weeks now. So we're expecting a, an answer uh, any day now. And hopefully, I can't tell you exactly when it'll be out. But once it's accepted, we can post it on, um, we can post the draft version on a, a SSRN or something like that and, and let people have uh, early access to it. Wonderful. And um, let me also say that Sarah and Ben have given us permission to record this. So that will be available as well as um, to make their slides available although they may do a final review before um, the slides are uh, uh, going to be on our website. So you can stay tuned for that um, and we'll post them as soon as they're available. Um, another question, who gets to manage the boundaries of the emergency use of samples and data and at what level would that take place? I think the quick answer is probably the IRB, but you, you, you may have a lot more detail um, to provide on that. So my my view is that yes, it should be on the IRB or institutional level, um, so the hospital or university, uh, rather than on any sort of state or federal level. Um, IRBs are charged with governing um, the the research that goes on in an institution, and I think they're perfectly well situated to do this sort of analysis. And we were really writing this paper too. Uh, some future set of IRBs that would be faced with this sort of question, and it and it it's worth uh, emphasizing that um, that the University of Washington IRB that that oversaw the Seattle flu study 
I think did a really excellent job and and came to the right conclusion and under difficult circumstances. Um, so I think I, I I have a lot of faith in IRBs to to get this right. Do you I, worry? Can I add just a little bit to that? Um, oh, sure, sure. You know, when we didn't talk about this much, but in the paper we talk about the uh, public health surveillance exception that's now built into the common rule. And that exception does uh, it clarify, um, at least in um, activities that count as public health surveillance, that there ought to be buy-in from a public health authority um, that is engaged in the practice of public health um, surveillance and protections. And so I agree with what Ben said, and ideally there would also be buy-in from a public health agency, not necessarily at the federal level, but at least at the local level where these surveillance activities is taking place because that would maximize the utility of this activity and the likelihood it would be used in ways that promote the public's health. Um, but I agree that it seems with the facts that we know about the original case that I was, I was actually very pleased that the IRB and the investigator were in agreement that this was such an important activity and had done the analysis about group harms, et cetera. So I think we, that increased my confidence that we could rely on that as a starting point. Right, and of course, public health departments do have their own IRBs, but I, I wonder if you could comment on concerns about harmonization. I mean, what if we had different IRBs in different jurisdictions coming to different conclusions, and what, how, how might that impact your analysis and thoughts about um, having, having these approaches to, to repurposing? Well, I mean, I don't want to say that a lack of um, perfect uh, consensus across a set of IRBs would be necessarily bad. It's possible that they could come to a conclusion in some cases where there are significant group harms and they, they might appropriately say, say no. If, if they're using a framework like ours, however, I would say that um, I think these are pretty easy cases. I think the benefit or the prospective benefit is um, is pretty high and pretty straightforward and the harms are are uh, individual harms are 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 very small and the group harms are ones that we think can be managed pretty well so hopefully there wouldn't be a ton of um disagreement among IRBs but that's why we wanted to to write this article and to take this um controversial Seattle flu study case and Use it as a as a, a, a teaching tool, as a uh, jumping off point to to analyze this sort of tension between public health ethics and research ethics. Yeah, and to even present it in a forum like this one, uh, with this particular audience before it was even published, with a, a, a little bit of um, humility, knowing we may not have, we may not have gotten everything right. People might disagree. The more we start talking about it, the more we might be able to forge consensus about the underlying principles and people can act on them in ways that are at least collaborative, if not um, in, in complete agreement. Um, what about letting donors know about additional research that's done with their samples uh, and then allowing them to opt out after the decision is made to use the samples from that biobank? So sort of keeping a list and then um, uh, um, dealing with it after the fact? So, so sort of like, post hoc notification um, and and maybe a mechanism for opting out. So so it's interesting. We we argue that that there's no need to recontact people to obtain prospective consent. I mean you could argue under something like the um, the emergency research ethics framework that that a after the fact notification would be an appropriate additional um, protection for subjects, but but I'm not sure it's necessary because um, they're not going to keep doing research with these samples. It's going to be a fairly uh, acute moment in which they actually need to use these um, these samples, and so uh, I'm not sure that notification after the fact would would gain that much. And and I don't even know what opting out would mean because by the time you got around to notifying them, uh, you'd probably be done using their samples, you'd probably already have converted to using prospectively obtained consent, uh, consent for, for this kind of research. Um, but it's an interesting to, thing to explore. And if the uh, situation was 
different, you could imagine that it, it's not it's it's a it's a feasible idea. So I'd want to think a little bit more. Yeah, I can imagine a scenario in which, and and maybe this is similar to what happened in the Seattle flu study, um, in which the original decision to start analysis is done without recontact and specific consent, but that uh, converting that into a more longitudinal approach with increased robust communication, with collection of, of longitudinal clinical data or follow-up testing to follow people over time. I can imagine a way in which the original decision could be bundled. With, I, again, the, the opting out, I think, after the fact is it, it's kind of like emergency research. Once it's done, it's done and you're, you're acting in good faith up front, knowing you're taking away the decision from somebody. So acting out is very limited except for the opportunity to do longitudinal work that right. requires consent. But I think um, I'm not opposed to the idea of adding uh, robust communication to this to uh, sort of increase transparency and education about what happened, as well as maybe to share results depending on the nature of the work. Right, I thought of the sharing of results also, and it seems a sign of um, transparency and respect, you know, just as you said, a communication point more than a permission um, tool at that point. Um, did anyone go back to the Washington study donors to ask them what they thought of the argument? I haven't seen anything, uh, any, any data or information about, um, about what they thought. No. Sarah, have you heard anything about that? I haven't. I haven't. That would be a great question to follow up with some of our colleagues. Yeah, that that would be an interesting qualitative study to go back and, and talk to those donors and see how they felt about their their uh, samples having been repurposed. Uh, and then we had a question about the scope and breadth of the research uses. Um, if not just for surveillance, could they be used for basic science, for genomics of susceptibility? Uh, do you have any thoughts about um, sort of cutting off the scope, or would this be for broad broad purposes? I, that's a really good question, and it's one we we address in in some detail in the paper. We use a term pandemic uh, related uses, and so we don't think it's okay to repurpose samples for to use the the public health emergency as a, a mechanism to do completely unrelated research or non-urgent research. We really envision repurposing only being justified in cases where there's a pandemic-related reason that needs to be explored right now. Um, but the examples you just gave are all ones, I think, where that would be the case. So uh, I, gave a, I gave a series of uh, examples at the beginning, things like exploring um, genomic susceptibility, host susceptibility, or uh, exploring whether uh, treatment, emerging treatments would work, um, or uh, sort of the, the natural history of the disease and what, what risk factors make people more or less prone to getting sick or, or dying. Those are all legitimate reasons. Um, I think to to repurpose samples, but going beyond that for non-pandemic related reasons or non-urgent reasons, I think would be out of bounds. I agree. Um, uh, so this is a, a enticing question here. The ethical analysis of the appropriateness of repurposing samples rests in part on consensus that we are in a public health emergency, and given that, how much should we take into account the, and I'm quoting the questioner here, seemingly growing social media view that COVID-19 is a hoax? So this, this I think, uh, maybe goes back to my answer to the prior question about communication. I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't base good public health practice on whether people believe that the science is valid behind it. But I do think we should take public education, public misunderstanding, uh, and mistrust of science very seriously. And so I think more open communication about what we're doing um, and the reasons why and increasing our ability as scientists and public health professionals to be able to communicate about these issues and um, working in collaboration with public health officials instead of oppositionally with them all 
help to address these kinds of issues. Obviously, this is a much bigger problem than um, we really can tackle in this particular project, but I think that might help us sort of qualify how we should engage with the public about this kind of a problem, maybe try to anticipate in consent language and in community engagement of various kinds in the future that this could happen again so that it doesn't completely take us emotionally and by surprise the next time around. Uh, in terms of retesting specimens for research purposes, if you were testing samples that were originally purposed for, for flu, for COVID-19, would these samples be identifiable and would you try to contact the participants to report their results? You did speak a bit to um, return of results issues, but uh, would you consider that a priority? Uh, yeah, I think that would be a completely legitimate reason to be testing these uh, samples to to A, see if there's community spread, uh, but then to B, if there are positive cases to inform those people that they are positive quickly um, so that they can take appropriate medical action or, or self-isolate um, and so that contact tracing could be done, particularly, again, in an early moment of a, of a pandemic when there are only a handful of cases or, or there, there are relatively few cases. Uh, there's an opportunity to cut it off right there. And so, um, so yeah, I think keeping those samples identifiable for that reason is really important. That's why we consider the case of identifiable samples as the sort of core question in this paper. Um, and of course, it depends on things like the accuracy and quality of testing that we have available. But I think at the time, any bit of verifiable information could have been quite beneficial, could have been used for contact tracing. And so, I mean, I think that's the kind of scenario we wanted to be able to envision, but we'd have to have all the facts and the science in front of us as we were evaluating any given study to be able to make that call with confidence. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question and then we'll need to wrap up. Uh, so for our final question, if you were on the IRB, would you allow the creation of a cell line from the public health research? from these repurposed samples? Uh, I would need an extraordinarily strong pandemic-related reason that that cell line uh, from those repurposed samples uh, is a unique resource that needs to be created right now. And like Sarah just said, I'd need all the science in front of me, but I have trouble imagining that sort of case convincing me um, barring an exceptional set of circumstances that I can't think of right now. It does. Yeah, that does seem like a situation where you might want to go back to the uh, participants and seek reconsent. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, okay, thank you, um, Sarah and Ben, so much. And to our remote participants, uh, we did have some questions that we were not able to get to, I am going to communicate with Sarah and Ben. Um, I'll send them uh, what we have, and hopefully you can uh, have a conversation as appropriate uh, on those. Um, we did get a question about whether um, an email will be sent to those registered when the presentations are loaded. Stephanie, I don't know if you can um, address that. I'm not sure how that works. I think uh, the answer is just keep watch on our website when it's loaded. Uh, do you actually send out an email to the registrants when when uh, recordings are, are um, uh, uploaded onto the website? Yes, an email should go out um, oh, via WebEx. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. That's good to know. Uh, and so I want to thank everybody for um, participating. Thanks especially to Sarah and Ben for your time and your very thoughtful presentations. And we do have um, uh, one uh, enriched forum. Stephanie, can you advance the slides because I don't have the details of that. Here we go. <laughs> it's on September 1st. Uh, it is the um, Magenta study that is currently going on at um, MD Anderson. Our speaker is Karen Liu. Um, this is a study about uh, making genetic testing more accessible through um, recruiting uh, uh, individuals for germline testing uh, who have been diagnosed with cancer. <laughs>
So um, thanks again, everybody, and we look forward to your participation in the future.